Hello all, and welcome to our new series of profiles in Japanese cinema. In this series, we'll be taking a brief look at folks who have made important contributions to the medium, whether they be directors, actors, writers, cinematographers, and so on. Be sure to like this video if you enjoy the new format, and let us know in the comments below what your thoughts are, and who you'd like us to cover, as we're excited to explore the world of Japanese film from this new angle, and we hope you are too. Today, we'll be kicking off the series with one of our favorite directors working today, Naoko Ogigami. Naoko Ogigami was born in 1972 in Chiba Prefecture, just east of Tokyo and sitting on the opposite side of Tokyo Bay. Ogigami's family remained in Chiba throughout her childhood, and as a young woman, Ogigami attended Chiba University's Department of Image Sciences to study photography. She hadn't held a special interest in film growing up, nor even when she entered university. But it was at Chiba University that Ogigami developed an affection for the moving image. After graduation, Ogigami decided to venture into the world of film. She says that, at the time, she believed Japan to have no good film schools, though she says that there are some now. If she weren't to stay in Japan, where was she to go for film? Given the image that the American film industry projects to the world, Ogigami figured that California was the place to be a thought which informed her move to Los Angeles in 1994. Her first year in America was spent studying English, followed by three and a half years in the graduate program at the University of Southern California's film school. She remained in California until 2000, when she moved back to Japan, but not before directing her first short film, 1999's Ayako, about which information is scarce and a copy of which is even scarcer. IMDb lists Ayako as an 11-minute horror project and offers a cast list, but doesn't go in-depth on its plot or even release date. While in California, Ogigami says she was largely ignored in school, being the only Japanese student at the time and not being great at English. At the same time, Ogigami has since been forthcoming with praise for her professors, who she says were interactive and hands-on. Some of these professors made an impact by helping her write her first script and fully realized this was the path she wanted to follow. Ogigami stated in a 2012 interview that upon returning to Japan and getting her foot in the door with the film industry there, she realized she could have continued making films one after another non-stop. This realization was paralleled by the understanding that she would never become a director in this way, the role that she truly strove for. After coming to terms with this, Ogigami quit the big leagues as a small fry and instead went independent. This was likely not helped by the social stigmas attached to her re-entry into Japan as a young woman without a job or a relationship, two qualities for which Ogigami says her neighbors looked down upon her. Luckily, once Ogigami struck out on her own, she counted herself lucky, as she states that she faced minimal discrimination as a female director. Minimal being the operative word here, but we'll get to that. Taking to independent cinema like a duck to water, Ogigami released her first film in 2011 with Hoshino-kun Yumeno-kun. This one, a medium-length project, clocking in at just under an hour, would go on to win several awards at the 2001 PIA Film Festival, marking her first splash into the Japanese film scene as a director. Ogigami explained years later that this film was shot over the course of a week, with fewer than a dozen friends, and that she edited the film herself before submitting it into the competition. While Hoshino-kun Yumeno-kun is available for those wanting to dish out the cash for an imported DVD, printed by the PIA Film Festival no less, it suffers in the English-speaking world from a lack of subtitles. What's more, many English sites either seem unaware of the film's existence or ignore it, with IMDb outright not hosting a page for the film. Even Ogigami and her many English-language interviewers only seem to pay lip service to the project, instead claiming its follow-up as her proper debut. That being said, we English speakers have lucked out in recent years with Ogigami's output. Ayako and Hoshino-kun Yumeno-kun remain her only untranslated films with all released after this containing English subtitles on their Japanese DVDs, or else benefiting from fan subtitling efforts. Following the festival success and DVD release of her 2001 short film, Naoko Ogigami would go on to direct her first feature-length project. Released in 2004, Barber Yoshino, alternatively known in English as Yoshino's Barbershop, was financed through a PFF scholarship in 2003. 
Filmmakers who take home awards any given year are allowed to submit ideas for their next big project, one of which is selected and funded by the film festival per year. Barbara Yoshino was a notably larger project for Ogigami, both during production and after release. Unlike Hoshino-kun Yumino-kun, this one was given a lengthier schedule for filming. Thanks to this, Ogigami has said that she felt overwhelmed and bewildered by the process, but has since gained enough experience for flexibility in her filming. After its completion, Barbara Yoshino made its debut at the 2004 Berlin International Film Festival, where it received a special mention in the children's film category. One year later, Naoko Ogigami returned with the film which would end what you might call the first arc of her career, 2005's Koi wa Goshichigo, in English, Love is 575, stands out from the rest of her filmography as the one project without much critical or festival fanfare. Its fan scores online are all over the place as well, though if we're to trust IMDb, the site with the most reviews for the film, it wasn't just the festivals who weren't biting with this one. The film revolves around a haiku writing contest, hence the title, and plays on the tropes of the Seishun Ega, or youth film becoming the logical extreme of this narrative style. We mentioned that this was the final film in her first period of filmmaking, partially because this was the last project in which Ogigami says she intentionally used a three-act structure. When she learned screenwriting at USC, her professors had insisted upon using this common, easily digested format. After 2005, however, she decided to abandon this structure moving forward. As it would turn out, the three-act narrative wasn't the only thing left behind. Ogigami's next film, Komomi Diner, was put to screen only 12 months after Love is 575. This film, shot on location in Helsinki, Finland, was arguably her first smash success, and is noted as her international tipping point thanks in large part to the film's setting. Kamami Diner earned its co-star Masako Motai a nomination at the Japanese Academy Awards in 2007 for Best Supporting Actress, though she lost out against Yu Aoi for her performance in Hula Girls. You remember that we mentioned that Ogigami had been mostly spared discrimination due to her gender? Well, as it turns out, Kamomi Diner came about as a byproduct of what discrimination she did face. In 2011 and 2012, Ogiyami explained that she experienced, as she put it, an inconvenient event through the Japanese movie scene. In a separate interview, she admitted that this inconvenient event was her assistant director on Love is 575 being an older man who was jealous of her director status who took to bullying her on set. Due to this treatment, she requested of her producer that they make a film abroad. The producer had been to Finland and pitched it as a potential getaway from the trappings of Japanese filmmaking. Upon commencing production, Ogiyami says that she realized a more laid-back lifestyle, which provided the opportunity for work and rest in balance as opposed to overwork. In working with the local staff, she realized it wouldn't help to get mad at anyone for taking time and going at a slower pace. The story she tells in particular involves a woman on the crew having 10 minutes before a train arrived for filming, and that the woman used the time to get ice cream rather than waiting patiently. Rather than bullying her crew, Ogigami instead decided to change her own rhythm to match that of her surroundings. In turn, Ogigami says that she fell in love with Finland to the point that she visits almost yearly. Komome Diner also marked a turning point for Ogigami, as the film was produced in conjunction with Paradise Cafe, a television and advertising company, with whom she has continued to work to this day. Another year and a half later, Ogigami made her return to the Japanese film scene with 2007's Megane, or Glasses for English Speakers. This project was based entirely in Japan once again, but continued the rejuvenation process for Ogigami. Megane became another slow and steady film concerning a woman who decides to take a vacation, which doesn't go exactly according to plan. This one brought home another award from the Berlin International Film Festival, as well as garnering a nomination at Sundance in 2008. Between her previous project and Megane, Ogigami had finally planted herself in the middle portion of her career. These years were marked by films in the mood known as Iyashikei. This term, which means something like healing or therapy, rejuvenation or soothing, is a subset of media which has the effect of comforting the audience and offering them a sense of peace amidst their crazy lives. 
think of most slice of life anime and you not only understand the general outline of Iyashike, but also Ogigami's works released between 2006 and 2017. Ogigami comments from time to time that she never applied this term to her work, but that it has been put on her by critics and fans alike. While it might not have been her intention to produce Iyashikei content in the strictest sense, you'll likely be hard-pressed to find fans of hers who would argue harshly against the term being used on films like Megane. The following year, Ogigami helped found Sorokitos, a production company which has since helped other aspiring filmmakers as well as continuing to produce Ogigami's own work. The company which takes its name from the Finnish phrase meaning thank you very much, has served as a home base for Ogigami with all of her projects since. For example, we have 2010's Toilet, another international production for Ogigami. This one, however, takes matters a step further than Komome Diner. This time around, we explore the dynamic of a Canadian family consisting of three adult children who don't speak a word of Japanese, and their Japanese grandmother who barely speaks a word of English. The last surviving parent of the kids has just passed away, leaving the four in an odd living situation. Upon release, Toilet received recognition from the Fumiko Yamaji Cultural Foundation and the Japanese Agency of Cultural Affairs, both offering awards for the film's merit. Like with her previous films, Ogigami used Toilet as an example of her films springing from single ideas or images, rather than fleshed out stories. In this case, she imagined a boy using a sewing machine, and from there the whole film arose. She reiterated in an interview discussing this creation process that she composes scripts at home while alone and not on set, but that she's open to changes as they come from actors and staff. However, certain specific shots, like the image of a boy using a sewing machine, must be preserved from the writing stage to the editing stage, meaning that she usually sticks to a script, even when her films may appear leisurely or meandering. Two years later, Ogigami released the final film in what we're dubbing her middle period, the time in which she was exclusively directing Iyashikei films. 2012's Rent-A-Cat is a quaint story concerning a woman who finds people in emotional need or distress and rents them cats for the purpose of healing. Much like the effects of Ogigami's films on her audience, these cats quickly and surely heal the hearts of the film's numerous secondary characters. Rent-A-Cat made a name for itself with a nomination for the Silver Moon Award at the Oslo Films from the South Festival in 2012. Later that year, Ogigami went to New York for overseas training in film courtesy the Agency of Cultural Affairs. Before this trip, Ogigami stated in a contemporary interview that more Japanese filmmakers should take up the challenge of exhibiting their films overseas, perhaps indicating her affinity for her own experiences in Canada, Finland, and elsewhere. After a string of successful, heartwarming films, Ogigami seemed primed to continue her winning streak. And then, for five years, she more or less disappeared from the Japanese film scene. In the intervening years taken off from film, Ogigami had twins and found it difficult to write. In spite of this, she composed five scripts in five years, but says that nothing panned out. This period also marked the publication of her first novel, 2014's Morio, an as-of-yet unadapted work. In terms of film, though, Ogigami could only hold off for so long, and in 2017 she made her triumphant film which marked the beginning of a new chapter in her filmography. After five years away from film, Ogigami made her return with the debut of her seventh feature film, titled Karera ga Honki de Amu Tokiwa. This title, which translates as something like When They Earnestly Knit, was given the English interpretation of Close Knit. This study of gender in modern Japan saw its initial release with Ogigami's first trip to the Berlin International Film Festival in almost a decade, before seeing wide release in Japan in February 2017. Close Knit revolves around a trans woman, portrayed by Tomo Ikta, who has developed a deep, loving relationship with her boyfriend. The boyfriend's niece, meanwhile, is largely neglected by her own mother, she being the boyfriend's sister. The film explores the growing dynamic between this abandoned girl, her uncle, and her new aunt. The film was screened right around the same time as a novel of the same title, co-authored by Ogigami, was printed. Critically, Close Knit rapidly became her best-received film to date, 
with eight wins and five additional nominations garnered across ten international film festivals. It also gained attention in the metropolitan areas of Japan such as Tokyo and Osaka, though Ogigami repeated across multiple interviews that in the Japanese countryside, close-knit was largely ignored. Part of the reason we denote this film as sparking a new portion of Ogigami's career is actually largely inspired by her own comments. Ogigami was quoted in 2016, prior to the film's release, as saying that she sees Close Knit as marking a second part of her career. From this point on, she declared that she would no longer produce as easygoing of works, putting behind her slow life and the Iyashi K portraits of the prior 11 years. One thing didn't change for Ogigami during this change in her career path, though. That being how the film sprung into being. Ogigami says that Close Knit was partially inspired by having numerous gay friends in the 1990s in California while attending USC. Upon returning to Japan, she noticed right away that she didn't encounter anyone who was out. Reflecting on this dichotomy sparked Ogigami's interest in using her power as a director to make an LGBTQ film for the sake of expanding the dialogue on these individuals and their struggles within Japan. After an intensive all-year festival circuit for Close Knit, Ogigami continued to pop up throughout the following two years to present the film and offer Q&A sessions for foreign audiences. A huge number of these are available in English, even right here on YouTube, and a lot of them are criminally underviewed. So if you're looking for more info on Ogigami's work and interests from the woman herself, please be sure to check these out. We've provided links to some of them in the description. Between all of these festival and art house appearances, Ogigami appeared once more in 2019, though this time in a writer position rather than in the director's chair. At this point, she took on the job of producing 13 scripts for the Netflix series Rirakuma and Kaoru, which was directed by Masahito Kobayashi. The heartwarming stop-motion project wasn't Ogigami's first foray into television, as she wrote and directed several other television dramas between 2004 and 2017, though none have made it into English, hence are not mentioning them until just now. These include 2004's Cactus Journey, the 2005 version of Yapari Mekoga Suki, 2008's Too Cool, and the 2017 drama Ryo Dokuya. All of these were written by Ogigami, but not directed by her, save Too Cool, where she both wrote and directed one episode, as directorial duties were swapped throughout the series. Too Cool is also notable here as it starred both Satomi Kobayashi and Masako Motai, the stars of Kamui Diner and Megane. In a Netflix interview, Ogigami explained that her work on Rirakuma and Kaoru revolved around the feeling that everyone gets from time to time where nothing is right in their life. It's a project exploring the relationship between Kaoru, a human woman who lives with Rirakuma, an oversized teddy bear, as well as some of their other friends and neighbors. In the same interview, Ogigami states that she has three cats at home, and that the comfort they offer is supposed to be emulated by Rirakuma and his friends. Overall, the series was received exceptionally well. In late 2020, it was confirmed that another series, Rirakuma's theme park adventure, had been greenlit, though writing duties have not fallen to Ogigami this time around. Looking to the future, it was recently announced that Naoko Ogigami's next film will be released in 2021. Kawaperi Mukorita is based upon a novel of the same name by Ogigami, released in 2019. This upcoming project stars Kenichi Matsuyama and Tsuyoshi Muro, and is set to concern a young man working in a fish factory. He's mostly antisocial at the beginning of the narrative, but the film explores how his life shifts when his next-door neighbor suddenly asks for a bath. We'll certainly be looking forward to the release of this much-anticipated project, which we'll be sure to discuss once it becomes easily available to English speakers throughout the world. With all of Ogigami's background wrapped, let's take a look at what makes her films uniquely hers as we go over the common themes and regularities of her various films. From time to time, Ogigami's films have been criticized for not having stories, an accusation that she seems to resent if her interviews have anything to say about it. This is likely because almost every single film Ogigami has written and directed revolves almost exclusively around the daily lives of their main characters. Her earlier works were mainly criticized for being slow and aimless. As early as 2010, with Toilet, she began experimenting with more camera movement and different focuses within the frame to try and break from these claims. Yet, all the way until her most recently released film, Close Knit, Ogigami's leisurely pace of action and narrative progression have continued. 
Her films have evolved, but have remained focused on the minutia of daily life for her characters. Whether they're living their best lives, they're on vacation, or they're accidentally transplanted to another location. Speaking of which... Another commonality in many of Ogigami's films is the fish-out-of-water narrative, often in the case of the main character, but also in the case of many of her secondary characters. Several of her films detail the odd lives of people taken out of their element, or else people finding their element, including Megane, Kamame Diner, Toilet, Rent-A-Cat, and Barbara Yoshino. In the later example, we observe an entire town of people sporting the same haircut, except the transfer student, visually expressing from the get-go that our main man is the fish out of water in this scenario. Kamome Diner concerns a trio of women making their ways through Finland, one intentionally, one on a whim, and one accidentally, and how this intersection in their lives will shape them as individuals going forward. Toilet looks at a trio of adult kids who have just lost their last surviving parent, only to be left with their Japanese grandmother who barely speaks English. She is the obvious fish out of the water splashing into their pond here, but all three of them are shown to be similarly fishy. One as she tries to fit in with her college, one as he tries to reintegrate into society, and one as he tries to fall back in with his family. Rent-A-Cat explores a woman without a conventional occupation who takes on the role of fish out of water in a proactive way. Rather than going somewhere else, she parades around her own town with her wagon full of cats intruding on the lives of others in order to help them. The form of unity present throughout these many characters' interactions with their co-stars and their environment presents itself in perhaps two unique ways for Okigami. The first is the prevalence of food throughout her narratives. As she explained, quote, I liked to depict normal lives of people, and because we do three meals per day, it's not strange that there are some scenes with food. It's inevitable. And with her films, inevitable it is. Food is displayed as a means of connection between people meeting for the first time, reconnecting with family, or connecting with oneself through internal dialogue. It's a visual means of displaying these bonds while simultaneously representing to the audience the niche which Ogigami's films occupy, comfort food. Metaphorically, we feel through watching her films as her characters feel while enjoying these meals, at peace and content. The other element concerning unity and bonding that sets Ogigami's body of work apart from many other filmmakers is her almost utter lack of romance. None of the films from her second era, as defined previously, contain important romantic subplots. This shifted with her third phase in Close Knit, which is based around a couple, but even here we're not exploring their initial spark in the period of them falling in love. Instead, these two have been together and have been happily satisfied for quite some time. Their relationship is more of a subplot than the driving force of the film, more a foundation than all the decorations on top. Without the need for or focus on romance, Ogigami's filmography maintains a potentially wider audience. Those disinterested in romance stories don't need to worry about her films being bogged down by too much love at first sight guff, and can instead explore longer living relationships that survive their first stage. The final, and perhaps broadest, commonality of Ogigami's work is her depiction of humanity. This perhaps links back to Ogigami's view of herself and her treatment at the hands of critics and journalists alike. See, we first discovered Ogigami thanks to her coverage as a female director. Admittedly, that helped us to find her in the first place, but, well, Ogigami sees herself as a director, not a female director. She's mentioned this attention as a woman makes her uncomfortable when everyone who interviews her and writes about her mentions it in literally every single article that they publish. Just as Ogigami wants to be seen as human and on equal terms with her male counterparts, many of her characters either want to be seen as simply human, or else they are made to learn about their humanity over the course of their character arcs. The kids in Toilet need and want to function as a family, yet for multiple reasons can't at the plot's beginning. Over time, they grow comfortable with themselves and learn to accept one another more. We see the loneliness and coldness which Ray needs to overcome, Lisa navigating the perils of college dating. Don't worry, this one doesn't count as a romance plot since it goes nowhere. And Mori learning to feel comfortable in his own skin. The minor characters of Rent-A-Cat are all shown to need cats which provide lessons for appreciating life. These small feline friends help one woman to not place everything in life in a hierarchy. They help another woman feel content in her daily life, and they help our leading lady have purpose. 
Perhaps most obviously and most recently, Rinko in Close Knit has the acceptance of Makio, her boyfriend, and the acceptance of her parents, yet she still faces discrimination publicly. She has made peace with her humanity and her place in the lives of her friends and family. Conversely, young Tomo also learns the importance of humanism thanks to Rinko's lessons while learning to get along in the world in spite of all of its unfairness. As you can hopefully see, in the two decades she has been working, Naoko Ogigami has produced a sizable body of work with a remarkable amount of consistency in quality and theming. Her films are unfortunately somewhat obscure in terms of home media in English-speaking territories, but with the help of subtitles, both official and fan-translated, her films are accessible to those interested. If you're intrigued by modern Japanese cinema or heartwarming film, the works of Naoko Ogiyami are certainly projects you should keep your eye on. They're hilarious, charming, touching, and true to the human experience. There's something universal within her work, making her films certainly worth checking out. We personally have yet to find a dud among her films, and we look forward to what Naoko Ogiyami's future holds.